Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, we will continue with the properties of universal unifying algebras. So, we will actually state uh, the very main important theorem on this uh, li li these algebras called Poincare Birkhoff fit theorem. So, I am actually going to give only uh, partial proof. So, we will actually complete the full proof later when we have time. Okay? Because the statement of this theorem is more important and of course, the ideas are also important, but in some different context. Okay. So, let us actually uh, just uh, uh, give some motivation for this theorem. So, let us actually look at uh, the symmetric algebra associated with G. So, take G to be Lie algebra. Now, we can just assume to be finite dimensional Lie algebra, there is no issue. Let us say we have basis x1, etc., xn. So, this is uh, basis of G, where n is the dimension. Okay. So, we can actually take the symmetric algebra. So, which is by definition you take Tg and then go modulo two sided ideal generated by x tensor y minus y tensor x, where x and y comes from G. Okay. Then we have already seen that this is naturally isomorphic to the polynomial algebra generated by these variables x i, x 1, x i, x n. So, here in this polynomial algebra, we assume that x is commute. Okay? This is commutative C algebra. Now, if you think about it, there is a natural basis of this which is given by x i 1 etcetera x i k, where this i 1 etcetera i k, they all come from 1 to n such that since all the variables commutes, I can arrange it so that I can arrange it in the increasing order. Okay? So, these elements will form a basis. So, this is actually very easy to prove. Now, you can ask that okay, if we go to the universal unifying algebra, so when g is abelian, then u g is same as s g. Okay? In that special case, we have such very nice basis. But if you take general g, then recall what is u g. So, u g by definition, you take T of g, go modulo two sided ideal generated by x tensor y minus y tensor x minus the bracket x y where x y comes from g. Okay? But it is somewhat very very close to s g. Okay? It is not too far from s g. Only thing is the bracket of x y is being 0. So, g is abelian then s g and u g are isomorphic, but g could be non-abelian. Okay? the cases that we will be interested in only SL and GLN, they are highly non-abelian. But what are the relations that we are going modulo? Just look at the relations. The relation says that whenever you commute the variables x and y and you are paying a cost, that cost actually given by lower degree terms. Okay? Whenever I commute x, y, and then write it as y x. Okay? Let us work in the u g itself. Let us denote x tensor y as x y inside your universal IP algebra. So, you have this map pi under the image, the tensors just written as product okay? as in the s g. So, there is no confusion here. Now, whenever you commute these variables, x y equal to y x, then you are saying that they differ by just this extra element plus bracket x y. But the thing is this element indeed comes from g. Okay? So, basically we are working in the images. Okay? So, I am just not using this iota of x, but I am identifying iota of x with x. Okay? But let us, okay, if you are not comfortable, maybe like let us do it with iota. So, basically this is iota of x and iota of y. So, iota of x, iota of y, when you 
commute them then you are paying iota of bracket x y s your cost but this is definitely lower degree term because that comes from the image of because it comes from the image of g okay so now because of that you can see that if you are taking any element inside ug that spans okay you can take any k tensor and then look at the image of the k tensor for any k that will be the spanning set for ug okay that's easy to see so ug is span by you can take all possible x i 1 etc x i k where now k can be any non negative integer such that only restriction is i 1 etc i k should come from it. So, this is definitely a spanning set for u g, but then now the question is can we arrange this in some increasing order ok. Now, the question is can we arrange these words in the increasing order. And Poincare Birkhoff theorem says that it can be done and that will again give you basis for your UG. Okay. So, here is the PBW type basis. So, you can always arrange, you can take iota of x i 1. So, maybe let us call them as uh, y i, iota of x i to be y i. Okay. So, then you can test take y i 1 etcetera y i k the product where k is greater than or equal to 0 and i 1 etcetera i k they all come from 1 to n. So, we can just simply write 1 less than or equal to i 1. You can always arrange them in the increasing order so that this form a basis. So, this set form a basis for ug okay so the basis of ug very much look like the basis of hg that's what pbw theorem says indeed uh, one can write the write very much equivalent statement which says that okay maybe i will just state it i will leave it as exercise if you know the construction of graded algebra then it's easy to see that the graded algebra associated with ug because we already seen that ug is a filtered algebra so there is a graded algebra that one can associate with ug that will be naturally isomorphic to the symmetric algebra associated with g so in particularly if you take the graded uh, piece kth graded piece that will be that will be same as the kth graded piece of this sg and then as long as you are actually taking the graded uh, algebra of filtered algebra. So, there is this natural way of identifying basis of ug with the basis of the graded algebra associated with ug ok grade ug. So, that is why you are actually getting somewhat look alike basis here in the ug that is what PBW theorem says ok. So, I will actually prove only that uh, this set will form up this set uh, will be spanning your Lie algebra ok. So, we will come to this proof of linear independence later ok that is somewhat bit involved, but if we need that uh, idea maybe we will come back otherwise we can actually skip that result. So, uh, how one can actually think about uh, arranging them in the increasing order. So, if you just uh, really actually take this word ok y i 1 etcetera y i k if it is in the correct order that means if it is in the increasing order then there is nothing to prove ok. Let us say actually you are reading it from left to right and then at some point the order is actually misplaced ok. So, let us say the very first instance where it happens call it orth position. 
So, then you have y i 1 etcetera y r minus 1 which are indeed in the correct order and then when you go to y i r y i r plus 1 they are not in the correct order. So, these two elements they are not in the correct order. So, then how do you actually kind of make them in the correct order? For example, like it can be 5 and then 3, but somehow you want to switch them and then make them in the correct order. How one can do that? Of course, we can do that because whenever you switch, you are only paying some element which are actually coming from the lower degree term. So, what does it mean? So, then this is exactly equal to so, y i 1 etcetera y i r minus 1. So, we can switch this to y r plus 1 and y r and then you can write all other elements as it is. So, now if you think about it y i r y i r plus 1 this is exactly equal to y i r plus 1 y i r plus there will be lower degree terms. Okay? It will be a bracket first of all bracket y i r y i r plus 1 and bracket y i r y i r plus 1 that is going to be there in your Lie algebra image of the Lie algebra iota of chi. So, that means the bracket y i r y i r plus 1 it is written as some summation some y let us say l j where a l j appears here or you can just write it in y j, a j, y j, j range from 1 to n. Note that y j is nothing but the image of image of i, okay? image of uh, x j. So, you have switched here, then you have to pay the price because this is this is what you are rewriting. So, now you pre multiply and post multiply by these words. So, you multiply by this and whatever is here, here. So, this is call it A and then B. Then you multiply here A, B and then again A, B and here you will be having A, B. So, here A, B and here again A, B. So, that means this is exactly gives you summation A, J, A, y j b. Okay. But note that these terms they are lower degree terms, they are lower degree terms. Okay. So, by induction on the length of the word, okay, lower degree means lower length also you can say whatever the degree means. So, then you can see that uh, by induction on, on the length or the degree. So, you can assume that that is already there in the span of these elements. So, you want to prove that let us call this as S. So, this set S spans your U G. So, that means by induction you can assume that. So, these elements are there in the span S. Okay. So, now what we have done? So, in the very first instant where the order is not correct, we could switch and then we can write it as some lower degree terms which are there in the span S. Okay? So, now if you if you take this particular word, again you can do the similar thing, you can read it from left to right. So, up to rth position, actually r plus 1th position, the order is correct. So, then from r plus 2 position whether order is correct or not you can read it again and then see. Then you can see that if it is not in the correct order then you switch back. Okay? Then again you will be paying some cost which, which will be sum of some lower degree terms. So, now by induction you can we can prove that any given word indeed is there in the span of S. Okay? So, that completes the proof that span of S is exactly u g. But it is not that easy to prove that uh, it actually uh, it is linearly independent. 
Okay, so we have to actually construct some representation of UG because uh, UG. So the motivation indeed comes from this. Okay, so UG is naturally going to act on the graded uh, algebra associated with VG that is in particular on SG. So using that action, you can actually prove that because this SG is being very big in dimensional in in dimensional space. UG is acting on that will be like will is going to give you like large representation. Using that representation, you can actually prove that uh, these elements will form a uh, linearly independent set there. Okay. So, what is the idea behind that? Let me just state the idea at least to prove something is linearly independent. Okay, to prove S is linearly independent, okay construct a large representation of UG. Okay. So, that means you have a map from UG to this uh, representation, let us call it endomorphism of V, where V is practically speaking it is infinite dimensional representation. Okay. It is infinite dimensional thing. So, now we can just assume it to be vector space over C. So, now look at elements x coming from S and look at phi of x. Okay. So, now what you can do like to prove that uh, phi of x they are all linearly independent. Okay. So, you can make this phi of x act on some particular vector. Okay, in the case of UG, you, you can take the unit element inside SG, you make it act on that. But then you can say that you are fixing some vector V0, okay, fix this and then make phi of x acts on this V0. Okay. Suppose if you have a relation summation AI XI is 0, then that would imply that summation a i phi of x i is also 0 and that would imply that summation a i phi of x i acting on this v naught will be 0. So, now you can easily see that if phi of x v naught this set is linearly independent then that would imply that a i s are all 0 for all i and that would imply that the set x x in s is linearly independent. So, this is the idea to prove that uh, any given set is linearly independent using the representation theory. So, you have to construct a big representation and then you can make uh, all the elements of u g to act on this vector space and pick a very nice vector so that when you act it using all the elements of this S, that set will form a linearly independent set inside capital V. Okay. So, then that would imply that the original thing that you started with will be linearly independent. So, that is the idea indeed used um, in order to prove that uh, uh, this uh, set is indeed linearly independent. Maybe like I will do this later. Uh, so now, uh, what one can do actually, uh, one can actually focus on uh, only the SLN representations and then try to see that uh, how one can construct some important uh, elements in the center of the universal Nepean algebra. Okay. So first of all, let me define some of the terminologies. So, let us call it the center to be the eject of u g. So, this is just uh, the center of u g. So, by definition this is those elements x in u g that commutes with all the elements. So, x y equal to y x for all x in u g. So, this is the usual definition that you see in uh, group theory or algebras. Okay. So, and then it is immediate that the center is indeed uh, subalgebra. Okay. This is, is a C subalgebra. So, UG is uh, 
is is an associative algebra with unity and the unit element commutes with uh, all the elements of ug so in particularly this is associative c algebra with again one okay that's most important and that's easy to prove only the product you have to check that uh, it is there closed so if you take x1 x2 inside the center then the product x1 x2 again commutes with all the elements of the g so that's easy to see so now uh, if you have some irreducible representation you can easily see that any element of the center indeed acts as scalar on that representation okay so that just follows from the schur's lemma but then uh, that kind of like so we need to have some guarantee that okay the center is always non trivial so that is why uh, we need uh, the construction of this caspier elements uh, to ensure that the center is indeed non trivial okay but the, but the thing is uh, one can actually prove this is the theory of uh, uh, harishchandra so he can, he introduced what is called central characters so using this theory of central characters one can prove that this center of the universal mapping algebra of a semi simple e algebra so that is indeed really big so it is a polynomial algebra okay so so one can prove if g is semi simple so then the center of the universal mapping algebra is a polynomial algebra and of course how many variables you can say of n variables where n is the rank of that uh, g okay if you take n to be the rank of g which is the dimension of the cartan sub algebra so then you can see that it is a polynomial algebra in n variables so it's not something very small for semi simple algebra so but that actually requires this central character theory to prove such statement it's actually very non trivial statement but what one can do like for all our basic purposes okay for example we are interested in proving wiles uh, complete reducibility for that purpose it's enough to actually produce one non trivial element inside your center okay so that is what uh, casimir element construction actually gives us so let us actually try to uh, construct uh, the casimir element inside your uh, the center okay so let us actually uh, just assume g to be slm okay for for the rest of the lecture so recall that the the killing form is indeed uh, the non degenerate form okay the killing form so what are all the property it has it is g invariant symmetric bilinear form okay this is also non degenerate non degenerate bilinear form or slm okay so now if you fix a basis whatever you can actually take the standard basis and then try to compute uh, what will be the dual basis of that but anyway if we take any basis x1 etc xn let's say n is the dimension of g so this is the given basis then we can talk about the dual basis of this with respect to the killing form so let's call this as beta dual basis with respect to beta so this is y1 etc let's say yn so that means it is defined as follows beta of xi yj is given by delta ij okay so now we can define the casimir element with respect to this pair let's call it c that is summation xi yi i i range from 1 to n note that this is we are taking inside ug 
I am allowed to take product of elements of G inside UG. So, I just take this products and then take the sum which is well defined element inside your UG and this is called Casimir element. Okay. The most important thing is this Casimir element lies inside the center. So, this is the climb, the C lies inside the center. That means C commutes with all the elements of G in particularly it defines for example, map from any representation to another representation as a G module map. Okay. If V is a G module, then I can define a map from V to V, we can call it C. So, you take the vector V and then send it to the summation. Okay, I'm I'm just dropping this iota notation, but you can always uh, use that. But now uh, you can see that using the PBW theorem, okay, the map the G to UG that we have this iota map. This is indeed injective map because the images of G indeed. Uh, lies inside the basis of uh, that we constructed uh, in the PBW basis theorem. So, then naturally this map becomes injective map because if it is not injective then there will be relations. So, that will actually give you relations on in G itself. Okay. So, so in particularly I can just simply denote iota of x by x there is no issue. So, we have this uh, vector v, we can just send it to x i y by acting on v, where i range from 1 to n. So, this is the map we are considering and this map you can see that commutes with the action of g because it is there in the uh, center of u g. So, it defines well defined g module map. So, that is the use of this. In particularly, if this map is non-zero map on given irreducible module, then you can easily see that that must be acting as a scalar because that is what Schur's lemma says. Okay. So, let us actually prove this, uh, this is indeed uh, uh, lies in the center. Okay. So, we need to make following observations. So, there are two observations you need. Observation 1 is that if you write some element x in g and then write in terms of the basis, okay, write the bracket x x i to be summation a i j x j and then write again x y i to be summation b i j y j. So, then we can easily see that using this associativity that uh, we have the following observation a i k. So, this is given by, so which is same as uh, uh, which is appearing inside this uh, summation a i j. So, this is going to be summation a i j. So, you can take it to be because the kappa is going to give you delta i j. So, this is exactly the kappa of g x j y k because this is just a delta j k. So, whenever j equal to k you get a i k. So, that is why you get this. So, this is exactly equal to uh, kappa of g the bracket x x i comma y k. So, now this says that a i k is exactly equal to kappa of g. So, you can just uh, switch them. Okay. So, then this is exactly x i so, you just switch this minus bracket x i x and then use the associativity or the g invariance. Then this is exactly x i comma minus the bracket x comma y k. Then if you just rewrite this, this is summation b k j kappa g and then x i y j, okay, where again j runs over this. Now, note that this is again delta i j. 
so whenever i equal to j it survives otherwise it's zero so this means this is exactly a k is exactly minus b k i so this is what you get as first observation so now let's look at the second observation okay if the if you put them together you will get the result the second observation is that and this is true for any endomorphisms so you take three endomorphisms from uh, any uh, endomorphism of v v being a vector space then you have the bracket x the bracket y z so this is going to be because this type of elements only will come when you compute the bracket c x where x comes from g so this bracket is exactly equal to the bracket x y z plus the bracket so y times the bracket x z okay so this is very easy exercise i will leave it as exercise okay so just check this so now if you use them then you can easily compute what will happen to the uh, bracket x c okay so let's compute for x in g okay let's compute the bracket x c so because x c is nothing but uh, x c minus c x inside your universal elementary algebra but we can just do this computation you can see that this is sum summation x the bracket x comma x i y i so now just to use this uh, identity then you can rewrite this as summation i the bracket x x i y i and then plus summation over i uh, x i times x y i okay so two summation you get so now the bracket x x i you can just rewrite so this is going to be summation a i j x j y i where i j runs over plus summation again i j runs over b i j x i y j so this is just the definition of bracket x x i and bracket x y i so now if you just think about it if you look at the coefficient x i y j okay so that okay maybe that other coefficient you can x j y i so that is you are getting here a i j but here if you take that you get b j i so that is what you get so this will be the coefficient of this coefficient now we already know that a i j is same as minus b j i okay so that means when you add them you will get zero a i j plus b j i is zero so that means this sum is zero okay so this proves that c indeed commutes with x for all x in g so that means c is inside the center so we will actually use this information uh, in order to actually uh, prove the complete reducibility so i will stop here and then we will start the complete reducibility proof in the next class thank you